Ben Jones. I'm a television host. I'm also an activist and a dad. And I'm very concerned about the country. We are at a turning point. We're either going to turn to each other or on each other. And we need to acknowledge what we're trying to do here in the United States of America is very, very tough. It's hard. You got every kind of human being ever born in one country. As with all hard things, there comes a time when you got to redouble your efforts to listen to each other and make any kind of progress. All right, we're rehearsing sound. Everybody quiet on the set. That's when I decided to begin working with Elijah Allen Blitz on a series of virtual reality experiences designed to create true empathy by putting the viewer in somebody else's shoes. I've always been a fan of Marvel Comics, and I felt like it was important to find superheroes who want to do good in real life. For our first episode, we partnered with Winston Duke from the film Black Panther. The episode puts you in the shoes of a 12-year-old African-American boy in the car with your dad, pulled over and harassed by the police. I'm more interested in, in white America seeing it. We wanted to make this available to as many people as possible. I was a beach cop down in Delaware, uh, so I, I got the police officer's perspective. Whenever we hear a story like this happens in the news, it's easy to say, you know, at least from my perspective, safety first. It really gives you a really new perspective of sitting in that sea as a kid, watching dad getting pulled out, and you don't know what's going to happen next. Now we used first ever hand tracking technology that puts the viewer in the body of the person they might initially felt like they got nothing in common with. What these people were experiencing in three and a half minutes, you could argue about for three and a half days. It's kind of shocking to see with your own eyes. And a feel. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Cut. For the second episode, we decided to focus on sexual harassment. And to do that, we partnered with Captain Marvel herself, Brie Larson. I wanted to focus specifically on the restaurant industry as a way of insight into a larger systemic issue of power imbalances. Being able to participate in putting someone in that experience of seeing how even microaggressions can be really impactful, hurtful, and traumatizing to others, I think will help us to create safer, fair work environments for everyone. We do have other episodes with other Marvel superheroes already lined up. Just a few decades ago, what we do every single day was considered impossible. But here we are, a miracle in human history. And we need tools to help us come together. We're always told, like, live in someone else's shoes. There's a difference between living in someone else's shoes and seeing through someone else's eyes. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Angela Waterketter, Senior Editor uh, in, for Culture here at Wired. Um, thank you so much for joining us for Wired 25. Uh, today, I'm pleased to be joined by uh, Van Jones, the founder, president of Magic Labs, the CEO of Reform Alliance and CNN host and contributor, uh, Elijah Allen Blitz, virtual reality director, and of course, actress, filmmaker, producer, and Captain Marvel herself, Brie Larson. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Uh, it's really great to have you. Good to be here. Thank you for having us. Great, great. Um, so obviously we're talking about uh, the Messy Truth, uh, the VR experience, which actually is also nominated for an Emmy. I want to say congratulations to you guys for that. Um, but first, you know, um, Van, why don't you take us back a little bit? Um, you know, we got a little bit of a glimpse in the, the video we just saw uh, of what the Messy Truth is. But, you know, tell us a little bit about the history of it, you know, kind of where this project came from and why you wanted, why you wanted to work on something like this. Well, uh, first of all, it's just a, a, a big honor to be here. Uh, I'm a Wired uh, fanatic, so it's, it's just good to be in this conversation. And, you know, I am a part of an industry that some people say is tearing the country apart. Uh, the, you know, mainstream media, uh, so-called corporate media. Uh, some people say that the business model is making it uh, more profitable to divide people and to bring people together. And uh, I don't want to believe that's true, but I want to make sure I'm doing everything I can uh, to use technology for good. Uh, is there a way for us to use uh, uh, virtual reality and anything else to get people together? We just heard uh, that incredible filmmaker uh, was talking about empathy. And she talked about how empathy is this sort of, you know, the backbone for human civilization. And I think that she's right. And, you know, I was so sad about, you know, after the, the Trump victory and all of just the, 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 the pain and suffering and division and misunderstanding going on across the country. 
and as somebody who grew up in red state America, got a lot of love for red state America, I'm raised my family on blue coast. And I just wanted, is it, geez, is there any way we could get people together? And I, then I got a chance to spend some time with Elijah. And Elijah is just a genius for uh, uh, bringing people together, finding solutions, using technology in innovative ways. And he said there's something called an empathy machine, uh, virtual reality. It's just never been used uh, you know, to, to really solve a social problem before. And I said, well, can we try? And he said, let's do it. And here we are with a, an Emmy nomination and, and mega stars like Brie Larson involved. And it's just an amazing experience. Uh, yeah, well, that tees it up perfectly. Elijah, tell me a little bit about, you know, how you got involved in this and sort of what you wanted to do when, you know, once you started working with Van on this project. Oh, yeah. I mean, from the beginning, we Van and I were actually working on something separate. But it, when once Trump got elected, it was less than a week after the election. We, we got on the phone and just both agreed we need to do something and we need to see if we can use the power of this technology to actually instead of dividing us like all the stuff that we've seen happening over the last four years to see if we can actually bring us together. So this has been beyond a labor of love. This is an actually it's, it's in a real way. It's a social experiment. And we're trying to see that if we can use this new medium in VR to actually, you know, put you in the shoes of someone else where you look down and you're fully embodied for these experiences in, in the you know shoes of a different race or someone from a different gender. And to really see, like Van saying, if this can be the ultimate empathy machine. Yeah. And, and Bree, talk about your involvement. How did you come on board and what really made you want to work on something like this? Elijah and I had a conversation about it. It was like the first conversation we ever had was about empathy. And um, when he was talking about this project, I was in the midst of working in Time's Up and I was like, oh, we need to talk about uh, tipped workers. It's a lot of what we're talking about with trying to put someone in someone else's shoes. I think one place that this really excels is dealing with power imbalance because it's an experience that you have to, it's very hard to have if your body limits you and you've never been in that experience before. This gives you a never before um, experience. So we started talking with um, ROC and uh, many women in the restaurant industry and collected a bunch of stories. Um, it's important, I think, to say that this project is their true stories. So when you're going inside somebody else's experience, we're not fictionalizing this. We're just telling the truth and allowing you to sit in it and feel it for yourself. Yeah. Well, you know, and for all three of you, you know, talk a little bit about that, because I think one of the great things about VR is that you can have an experience, a sort of first-person perspective experience on something that you maybe haven't been through, you know, in your own life, but at the same time, it's so intimate to the point where it can be almost overwhelming. Um, and so, you know, how do you find that balance? And, you know, how are you trying to reach that balance between creating empathy, but without sort of almost having a kind of traumatic experience or a kind of, like I said, overwhelming experience um, for viewers who are kind of doing some of these things for the first time? You know, yeah, we actually had to think. work really... Oh, go for, go for it, man. No, 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 go ahead. Oh, I, I was just going to say that, you know, that was something we had to work really hard on was I, when, like, a, like Brie was saying, identifying these stories and making sure everything's true, but then also B, making sure that it wasn't something that could potentially traumatize the viewer. So if, if, you know, it was the right mix, finding the right mix of, you know, both of these different episodes that we've created so far have to give you an emotional connection where something happens that draws you in and connects you to the, what you're witnessing, but then also at the same time, acknowledging the power of this medium where we're not going to give you an experience that could potentially traumatize you. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and I think, that, yeah, just, just saying, you know, you know, the ethics, you know, that Elijah brought to this, I think is really, really extraordinary. I mean, be very easy uh, to find a story that would be so shocking and, you know, people would jump out of their seat and go home and cry or whatever, but that's not the point. You know, what we're trying to do is find true stories. You know, if you, uh, you, you take a story like being a kid in a car with your parents. Everybody's been there before. But when the lights start flashing behind you and you get pulled over and you're a black kid, you never forget that. Well, I walk around with that. Every black person walks around with that. If you're a white person, you've probably never had that experience. Or if you did, it worked out fine. It was officer friendly. You know, maybe she's giving you directions or something um, or just giving you a warning, letting you go home. So we had to find an experience that would put you in that tension, put you in that 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 moment of holy crap like this is really going badly but then not have it so bad that you're just you're traumatized and so uh it's people said well how, do, how can you find these stories listen the stories are ubiquitous there's so many stories of, of gender discrimination sexual harassment racial harassment 
but how do you find one that's touching, that's moving, that doesn't traumatize people? That had to do with the ethics of the director, which is Elijah. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we, had, Thanks, we, had a, <laughs> we actually had a, uh, a viewer question. Uh, thanks, Andrea. Uh, wanted to know, uh, I think from Bree specifically, you know, how is it different working in VR versus working, you know, in traditional film? You know, what were the things that you kind of had to learn on the fly or learn on the spot? And, you know, how did you kind of incorporate that into, into what you do? Sure. So the thing with this particular piece is that it's one continuous scene, uh, about three minutes long, yeah. right? Each one's about three minutes yeah. long. So it's like a play. There's no coverage. So if I mess up a line, you start from the beginning. Um, if you want to try something in a different direction, it's a whole new take. And so the day is just, the beauty of it is you just need one take. Um, and the other side of it is that it's just, you got to encapsulate it all in one, one go through. So it's more like for this particular one, it's more like a play or doing a very short play yeah. than it is a traditional filming day. And the other piece is as a producer on this is you're thinking about the space. And I learned a lot from Elijah about that, about, you know, where the camera's placed, um, where it is in a corner, for example, so that, cause you initially, you want to look around and see, but then having a general focal point. So we work together um, from both of our backgrounds in, it, or in, in order to kind of streamline this so that you're getting, we're maximizing the impact within the experience. Yeah. Um, I think uh, Van and maybe Elijah as well, we saw in the video that you, it looks like you took the, you took this to CPAC and actually, you know, gave, gave it to some people to try out. Talk a little bit about, about that experience, you know, why you wanted to do it and also, you know, kind of what you, you walked away from that experience with. Well, look, I, this is a part of my life. Um, I am, you know, strong Democrat, work for President Obama. Um, I'm, a, you know, I'm at CNN. I'm not at Fox. Uh, and yet I have found that when you really care about the people who are at the bottom, uh, the people who are desperately poor or who are addicted or who are in prison or uh, who have mental health issues, those folks, whether you're talking about Appalachia, the hood, the Native American reservation, uh, the border, they tend to have the same basic problem, about 80 percent overlap. Might have a little bit more racism here, a little bit more classism over there. But you've got the same basic problems and neither political party, from my point of view, does enough to help the addicted, the afflicted and the convicted. And so I've never been able to get a bill passed or get something done to help anybody where I didn't wind up working with Republicans and Democrats. So I'm bipartisan because I'm so passionate about my progressive values. And what we wanted to do was to take this experience to CPAC, take it to the biggest gathering of conservatives uh, you know, in this hemisphere and just open our hearts up and say, here's what, here's what uh, you know, we've got to, to share with you. And we saw people taking off their MAGA hats, taking off their Make America Great hats, taking off their NRA hats and putting on those visors. And as you saw in that video, three and a half minutes later, saying, I didn't understand before. I didn't understand what it meant to be an African-American kid in a car getting pulled over by police officers with police dogs, et cetera. I just had never thought about it. And all we want is more understanding. We didn't go there to get them to change who they're going to vote for. I mean, it's a democracy, you can vote for who you want to. That's the whole point. Dictatorship, you can only vote for one person. Democracy, you vote for who you want to. But we want people to vote with more understanding and after the election to be able to have more understanding. And that's what we, I think we achieved a little bit at CPAC. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and the, the, you know, there, there was, okay. oh, what were we going to say? Uh, like, no, you no, no, say go, something? go right ahead. Okay. Oh, no, no I just to answer the, the yeah, the, just to elaborate on, on you know, Van's point about CPAC, one of the guiding principles from the beginning of this project is something Van always says that there's no throwaway people. And that goes mm -hmm. across the entire board. And so when, you know, showing up there for me, that was my first time at CPAC for sure. And I definitely did not know what to expect. But what I was immediately hit by is that we all have so much more in common than not. And there, I mean, there was like Van saying there was, you know, police officers that came and watched this experience and they were just coming out and be like, I have, I have a whole new perspective. And to be able to do that, to me, that's the goal of this project. It's not just to show people, you know, that agree with our perspective already. It's not to preach to the choir. It's to go out there and try and connect with people. And, you know, with Bree's episode, we plan to take that out as soon as you know, we can, obviously. Not right, this is not the right time with the pandemic, but once you know, we can go out there and, and share these different perspectives, showing people that might never get a chance to see this, that's really the whole mission behind this. 
Yeah, I was gonna. And that just, was and just, last. There you go. go ahead, Dan. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to say, and and so, and also, we plan on doing something about coal country, Appalachia, the opioid crisis, and take that to liberals, because yeah. you know liberals and progressives also have our blind spots and our assumptions and our lack of empathy, as much as we like to fly that that empathy flag. So you know, we 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 got a lot of stories we want to tell. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I was going to say about, you know, the the interesting thing with access and VR is that, you know, not a lot of people have headsets. So you do end up having instances where you have to be able to take VR out into the world and share it with people and, you know, let them sort of try these things on. And, you know, I'm kind of curious how, you know, obviously the with coronavirus that's sort of impacted your ability to do that. But is that something that you definitely want to sort of double down and commit to once it's possible to bring these things out into the world again? Yeah, hundred percent. That's that's our goal. I think. I mean, and yeah. we talk too about the ideas for the future of this is that we could create curriculums. They could be larger ones, smaller ones. They could be ones tailored for schools, um, ones that are put in museums. And um, we've even talked about putting this in a van and being able to drive cross, cross country and just put it on whoever we we see. Um, obviously, these are all dreams for for the future, not anywhere near. But. This is, this is about distributing the technology that we have, using the tools that we have. And these headsets are going to become, we think, much more available to people. And it's, I think it's important that this option is there. It's, of course, going to be used for many different ways. But I think having this as an option is incredibly important. Yeah. Um, Van, I'm curious. You mentioned in the video that you wanted to work with Marvel superheroes, and obviously we have a Marvel superhero with us. You know, why why was that? What were you kind of looking to do? Uh, you know, with bringing in folks from from that world into into this one. <laughs> well, well, I'm a I'm a super <laughs> geek. Like these are people are putting these books behind me. Are actually books. These are all graphic novels and stuff. Like I'm I was before I, I was a Marvel Comics geek when it was not cool. Uh, I was born in 1968, so I I was reading this stuff. I mean, I remember when you had to be a true, true nerd to know who the X-Men were, to care about the Avengers, all that sort of stuff. So I grew up with that. And the ethics of, you know, you hear me say ethics a lot, but ethics mean a lot to me. You know, Stan Lee's uh, vision of people with having a lot of power, having a lot of responsibility, sticking up for the underdog, not giving up, not becoming what you're fighting. Villains act a certain way. We're not going to act that way. We're going to have, have we're going to be better. All that stuff went into me very, very deep as a kid. And when I was a little nerd, getting you know bullied and wedged and pushed around or whatever, and then all of a sudden I'm six foot one plus, and you know, and, and nobody's bullying me anymore. I wanted to use my law degree and, and whatever I had to help people. Then suddenly Marvel becomes like the global. <laughs> like mythology for like you know the 20th first century civilization and and like so you have these actual heroes that have been burned into the minds of like seven billion people i said geez if these people actually decide they want to act heroically in the rest of the world they can they can move the whole planet and that's what we've seen winston duke's performance uh, he was uh um mbaku in the black panther his performance as a dad in this thing is unbelievable. The first one, Breeze, you know, performance in this thing is unbelievable. We've got others, you know, Josh Brolin, uh, Zoe Saldana, others who want to come in and do stuff. Listen, if, if, if Marvel wants to, if Marvel heroes or DC heroes, though I'm a Marvel guy, but if DC heroes want to <laughs> become heroic in yeah, the real world. Yeah, don't start a division with uh, that, man. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, like, anybody, anybody, even, <laughs> even DC and Marvel can get together. We're good. <laughs> yes. And we are. Um, well, you know, Bree, talk a little bit about that. You know, where do you see sort of the overlap with working on a project like this, you know, with your work in film and sort of being a hero in different ways and in different formats? Sure. I'm just always looking for new ways to do the right thing. Um, and this was one of them. So my interest in film was empathy. And for me, one of the things that I can tell um, with how far we're going with empathy is what films people are connecting with. And as we're seeing more diversity on film, it's exciting to me because 
I know what the experience is of watching a movie, you're becoming one with the person on the screen. It doesn't matter how many people you're watching the thing with, it's you alone and you are on the edge of your seat, hopefully with this person, you know, you are this person. So this is actually taking it a step further and just saying, hey, you're just gonna be dropped into this body and you're gonna experience it from a first person's perspective. So when I heard about this project, it was so exciting because it's the thing that I've cared about and wanted to achieve and I also am very limited in the roles and stories that I can play because of my body. And so this is a way to participate and continue to elevate and create more dialogue, more inclusion, and allow people to have experiences because that's what this is all about. You know, this is what we need is just more understanding. And I know that a lot of these words are sort of tired and overused and we're saying things like this a lot, but it's so true. It's so yeah. true. I mean, we really have more more that's alike than different. And so much of this, of this hatred we have for one another, whatever you consider the other side is based on a misunderstanding. And I think this is an incredible way that we can cut through that and say, we're the same. Yeah. Um, well, I, I was just watching, I was rewatching Avengers Endgame the other day and I realized that Captain Marvel is actually kind of an intersectional feminist when you think about how she wants to save earth, but also every other true. galaxy. So um, I think mm. that that is, I think that is very true. Um, well, and I'm curious, you know, cool, you talked thanks. a little bit about, yeah, welcome. Um, well, I was, you know, you were talking a bit about the, um, the things you have, you know, kind of going forward. I'm wondering if anything in 2020 could, you know, inspire anything in, in the future for something that you would want to do with, uh, with a VR project. Is that you for know, me? I, yes, I wonder. Yeah, yeah, sorry. For anybody. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead, Ben. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's funny you ask. I, I, I'm passionate about the immigration uh, situation, uh, you know, the, the recent reporting that there may be uh, uh, the enforced hysterectomies uh, against women in, our, in, in refugee camps and immigration detention. It's just unbelievable to me. Um, I know Zoe Saldana has mentioned that she wants to do something about immigration. Um, uh, I, I'm passionate about what's going on in Appalachia. I'm from, you know, uh, Tennessee. It's not a foreign country to me. Um, uh, but I haven't thought about the particularities of 2020, but um, in, in some ways we were, we were prescient uh, because, uh, you know, the, the situation with George Floyd and, and the whole Black Lives Matter uprising maps right onto what we did with the first one. Uh, certainly, you know, time's up and, and all of that maps onto what we did with the second one. Um, but there'll be many, many more. Uh, for me, the most important thing I can say is that uh, it's OK for us to disagree with each other. That's not a problem. We can vote against each other. We can march against each other, but we need to understand each other. That's the, listen, if, I, if we, you and I disagree, but I at least understand where you're coming from, we can still be neighbors. We can still be, you know, uh, in the same country together. If you are a complete mystery to me, if I have no idea where the hell you're coming from and we don't agree, we got a problem. And right now, technology, these algorithms, once the, once the algorithm knows, once your, your phone knows you're a liberal, it's only going to show you liberal content, I promise. Once they know you're a conservative, it's only going to be conservative. And so you think you're programming your phone. Your phone is programming you. And we've got to start using technology in a different way, not because we should never vote against each other, but because we should never vote against each other and hate each other. And that's where we're headed right now. I'm very concerned about it. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think we have time for one question. It wouldn't be wired if I didn't ask Bree. Do you know what's happening with Captain Marvel 2? Um, are you excited to get back into it? Oh, my God. I'm so <laughs> – Van is know. so excited about this question. <laughs> um, I am so excited to talk about that movie at a time when Marvel's not going to kill me to talk about it. So right. I'm going to pivot real quick and say, <laughs> in response to your question before, there's infinite stories to tell, and we've talked about – positive stories as well, moments of kindness, moments of compassion, um, mm -hmm. moments of, you know, when you're getting help from a stranger, um, disability episodes. Um, I just think that there's just as many people as there are on the planet, everybody has a story. Everybody has a moment that should be shared and experienced. And so we're excited to collect more and do more. And we hope that the more we talk about it, the more we get it out there, Hopefully there's people out there in the world that are like, that looks cool. Will you, we can, you know, we'll help you because that's, that's what we need right now. We just need help to keep pushing the project forward. Perfect. 
Well, thank you so much for joining us. I really, really love this conversation. And thank you for coming to Wired 25. Uh, yeah, have a wonderful day. Thanks, everybody. Thank, thank you, you so much. See you later. Bye. Bye. Well, that was a fabulous day, and it ended on just the right note. And it was an extraordinary set of conversations that were linked to what, linked together in ways that surprised me and probably struck all of you while you we watched. There was, I thought, a theme of people kind of going outside the boundaries of what you might expect them to do, whether it's as a UX designer or as a chef or as a filmmaker, and looking at broader questions in society and then using one's role in that position to do something bigger. And then of course, the big theme of the day was something Van Jones brought up at the end of that conversation, which is empathy. And that was the core of Reed Hastings in our conversation about how Netflix works across cultures and what the point of Netflix is, right? It was what the ghetto gastro people were talking about as we talk about the importance of understanding food, understanding the people who make it, understanding what it means. It's how we think about how horror films can help us see people we may not see, understand people in ways we may not have understood. And so that's the real theme of today, how empathy can help us connect, understand, and get closer to each other in a world that sometimes pulls us apart. So thank you so much for sticking through it. Thank you to all of our fabulous moderators, all of our superheroes who attended, everybody who put it together. Thank you to Samsung. Thank you to Vonage for supporting this. And very importantly, remember, this is not the end of Wire 25. It is day one, and we're going to be going on for the next two weeks. The next one will be Wednesday, September 23rd at noon Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific. We'll be talking again about some of the intense issues in our society. We will have a segment we're putting together on the fires sweeping the West. Dean and Steve Allen and Isla Myers-Smith Scientists documenting the climate crisis will be there. Sarah Fryer, the CEO of Nextdoor, a key shelter-in-place lifeline during the pandemic, will be talking with us, as will Arlen Hamilton and Katie Ray, both venture capitals and venture capitalists investing in under underrepresented entrepreneurs, capital-intensive tough tech, which is problems that are really important and hard to solve. And we'll have Maria Ressa. She's the CEO and executive editor of the news site The Rappler and a hero, a lot of us in journalism, for standing up to authoritarianism and reminding us why her profession, our profession, matters so much for the world. After all those talks, we're going to do some deeper dives with the speakers. You'll have meetups after the program at 1.45 p.m. Eastern, so stay tuned for those. They'll be announced on Monday. Registered attendees will be able to pick the ones they want to go to. So thank you. Thank you for coming to our first virtual Wire 25. It was an experiment for us, for you, but I loved it, and I hope you did too. See you at the next one.